welcome, Paula Dubell Pereira. I hope I said that correctly. And please correct me, Are, doctor? Um, yeah, you can call me doctor, but oh. you don't need to. Okay, so it's <laughs> I'm just Paula another Dubell. person. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate um, you being with us. I'd like you to share a little bit with our audience, if you don't mind, about how you became interested in aerospace engineering. Okay, so that's a very interesting story. I'm originally from Brazil, and I come from an island that is like a touristic island, and people don't really talk about like space engineering and space research in there. So I grew up like looking up and seeing that, oh my God, there are a lot of stars and there are planets and there are these crazy missions that people in the United States put in space. But it was always like this thing out there there and kind of far away, not really something that I could do. It was just a, 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 a nice thing that was happening. And then I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering because mechanical engineering is quite strong in my home country, Brazil. And then when I was going to reach the final years of my mechanical engineering bachelor's, I got involved in one thing called the Aero Design Competition, which is a competition for students in undergrad level for designing, building, and testing an un unmanned or un not not with a person. Sometimes saying man is a little right. deviating, so not with a person <laughs> vehicles. Um, and we did a one that was quite small. It was about 200 grams and we won the national competition with that team and it was amazing. And so we went to the international competition, which, okay, we were in first place in Brazil. So we were selected to go to the U.S. to, to fly our vehicle and compete in the U.S. And we came here and we were third place, like in the international competition with like all these great schools and very famous institutions. And I think that was one very important moment when things kind of like clicked. I was like, oh my God, I can come to the US. It, oh my God, I can do something like meaningful. And it, and it was from that day on, I was like, okay, I want to do airplanes because that was the thing that was like attainable. <laughs> and so I went back to Brazil. I finished my undergrad and I was doing two undergrads at two different universities at the same time. A, a little crazy, uh, but I still had one year to go on the other undergrad, so I decided to do a master's in Brazil at the same town so I could finish the second undergrad at the other institution, and so I did my first year of, of, of master's while finishing the other undergrad, and then I finished my master's, and that master's was in airplanes, basically. I was doing a lot of things in my undergrad with thermal dynamics and heat transfer. So I was studying how frost forms on the windows of airplanes. So I don't know if I've ever like got a flight and then you looked at your window and you saw those like yeah. crystals so, forming yes. on the window. Yeah. So we're working with Embraer, which is the biggest Brazilian manufacturer of, of airplanes. And they wanted to find a way to get rid of those. Um, I honestly think they're so pretty. <laughs> But they do inspire fear for some of us. We're like, man, that's where it's too cold. It's cracking. Yep, there you go. <laughs> that's a big, important <laughs> point in there. And so they wanted to diminish that or decrease that. So I was doing my master's on that topic. And then when I was getting to the end of the master's, I was like, okay, now it's time for me to apply to the U.S. <laughs> and so I applied to a few institutions for my PhD in the United States, and I was accepted at MIT, and I was super happy. Like I, wow, yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy. <laughs> it got like in the news in the town that I was living in. It was like, oh my God, a small town from Brazil, and the kid is going to like the U.S. to MIT. So it was it was fine. <laughs> being famous you're for celebrity <laughs> in your town right um but then I I came to the U.S. and when I when I arrived at MIT I was this airplane um idea in my head because that that's what I was doing that was what I would I knew I was able to do and so I started working on airplanes and when I was there it was very interesting how the department kind of like selected the students so normally in a normal or more common institutions you are selected in into the department and you kind of find your way through the department to a certain professor laboratory research topic etc but the way that that department was working in that period 
at MIT was a little different. They were kind of like selecting you straight to a project, to a professor in the lab. Mm -hmm. And so I was selected to a project that was completely on a computer screen. And I love to put my hands in stuff. <laughs> and I really needed to like get something and put on some screws or go to the machine shop and, and machine something. And I was really, really missing it. And I was in that, that lab for just a couple months when I was like, okay, I cannot do this. Like I cannot be here for five years without touching hardware. And that's when I started like looking around in the department and trying to change lab and go to a different professor in a different lab. And that was for the first time when I looked around and I saw like, oh my God, there is a lab here that does space research. <laughs> and I talked to the professor and the professor said I could do it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> and is this the star lab is this the yes star lab? yes so that was the star lab with professor carrie Cahoy. oh and yeah you know her quite well she's a yes. rock star she's as good a professor as you'll ever find yeah she's amazing she changed my life like a hundred percent hands down changed my life and and so when when she said that I could do space, then I was like, okay, if this MIT professor is saying right. I can do it, <laughs> then I can do it. <laughs> and so I changed labs and I started working with her and that was in early 2018. And since then I've been doing space and putting together spacecraft and working on probes to go to Jupiter and Europa and et cetera. And I've been learning as much as I can. And especially in my first couple of years, like I studied like crazy because I felt like I was so much behind from everyone else because everyone else had already been involved in that field for a while. And I was getting to the qualifying exams in the PhD and the qualifying exams are, are a big thing that you have to pass and that they test you on all the space systems engineering knowledge. And that exam was coming just like six months after I had transitioned from oh airplanes to space. And I was like, okay, now I need to get six years of knowledge in six months. <laughs> what do I do? So it was, it was intense, but I passed the exam and it, I learned so much since then. And I'm so happy. Like I, I did the transition and and that's when space became tangible and real to me. So what a great story. It really is. And now you have this new chapter of your life that began recently. Share a little bit with us, if you don't mind, what it is like at this new point in your life as I, I guess this is your first uh, professor appointment, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I finished my PhD in May 27 this year, so a few months ago. And I did internships before um, finishing my last of too many degrees, um, but I had never worked full time for someone because I had always been like a student or being in a lab in the university or doing an internship. So it's the first time that it's like officially like done being a student and full time working somewhere. and it's a very big shift. Like the, the change in mindset and the, the change in what you have to deliver and what are the constraints around you are very like remarkable. <laughs> and some of the things that are specific to academia that at least for me were quite um, not shocking, but interesting was that for the first time, I felt like I was able to do something without being evaluated all the time and also being able to, to do something knowing that people would kind of um, not believe me, but um, I'm trying to find the right word. But when you are a student and you're telling someone like, oh yeah, this is how it happens. People look at you and they're like, uh-huh, yeah, you're a student. <laughs> when well, you're a professor. You the authority. It's like you had the you know, credibility yeah. now. Yes, credibility. I think that's the, the word I was looking for. And this this shift and like being someone that people trust and people listen, I think that especially for someone who is like a small girl from a Latin country and 
has always been like oh no this is not for me like and now I'm like oh my god people people trust me people think well, I'm incredible they they're they're like <laughs> hanging on your words they like hear what you have to say so the roles reverse like you went from yes. being a student to being the teacher so to speak just yes. like that so that that yes. tells you. you're in demand for speaking engagements particularly at conferences so and and I joke with you about that because I was very excited that you agreed to come and speak at our conference recently. So thank you. Uh, yeah, fantastic. It was a pleasure. Yeah. You had mentioned that you were working on, um, and I'm not going to say the names correctly, but it I, I believe it had to do with uh, your current research on uh, I, I'm, I'm not drones, but you're working at something with small satellites. It, it, it's the probe. Probe. Yeah. Probe. Drone. Probe. There's an O. <laughs> There's an O yeah, in there. The, probe. The, the ducks or the underwater uh, probes. Is that? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your probes. Like what, what, what's going on with your current research with that? Okay. So the probes started when, let me take a step back. So there are a lot of planets in our solar system, and there are planets outside our solar system. Outside the solar system, there is this one thing called the habitable zone, which is like close enough to a star to be warm, but not too close, not to be hot. <laughs> so when we are looking for life outside the planet Earth, and we look for other stars, we look for the habitable zone and to see what are the planets in that zone. But here in the solar system, we have us, we have Mars that is a little bit inside a habitable zone, but we don't have other things. And we have already sent a lot of spacecraft to Mars. And it's like, uh, there is no living creature right there right now that we can find easily. So what if we try to find life in another thing that is not in a habitable zone? And there are these places called ocean worlds, which are basically either moons or planets that have a very large amount of water, so liquid water, that is being kept warm by something else that is not the sun. And this liquid water, there are a lot of different worlds around the solar system where it's in direct contact with some type of minerals like rocks or carbon-based materials and etc. And so you end up with liquid water that has energy because it's liquid so some heat that had to come to it and there are also organic elements and minerals and it's the ingredients that that you need to potentially have life so as soon as we found that there were planets or worlds most of them are moons in our solar system that have those things, have the liquid water, the energy, and potentially the correct chemistry, then, well, let's send something there and see if there is life. And the one that is, in my opinion, the most promising one, but there is a lot of arguments. <laughs> and if you ask another person, it would say it's another one. But the one that I personally like the most is Europa. Europa is one of the moons of Jupiter. And that specific moon is believed to have more than four times the amount of liquid water that the Earth has. So it's like a lot of water. And there has been some very good measurements showing that there is water movement. There is heat being released from the, the moon. So... Let's go there and see if there is life. Uh, the only issue is that that ocean is hidden by a layer of ice. Mm -hmm. And it's like a very thick layer of ice, somewhere between 20 and 50 kilometers of ice. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of ice that you have to go through. And it's not something that you can just get like a hand drill and <laughs> tap into. Yeah, you so you need to... Yeah, you need something big and you need to develop some type of technology that will be able to take you from the surface to the water in a decent amount of time. And so there has been some development on trying to use some type of mechanical drilling. There has been some development on trying to do like hot water jets and lasers. And none of those so far have been like validated in the lab in an environment that, it, that is compatible to the environment in Europa, especially temperature and pressure conditions. And there has not been like a thermodynamic model that 
gets the input of like the size and the shape of the probe and the amount of power that you're inputting it and then gives you as a result the velocity that the probe will have like there is not a validated model that does that so what my phd was on was trying to get the available models in the literature do some experiments and get the results from the experiment to improve the models and turn them into a validated models a validated model so that you could have something that you can input the size and shape of a probe, input the amount of power that you're putting in that probe, and have as a result the speed that the probe will have in the ice. And, and so that was my PhD, and I did mostly the experimental work, and then I worked together with people at JPL and Stone Aerospace to put together the improved models, and we are finishing to, to write down a paper. We are probably going to have it published in the next month or two, so nice. it will, will soon be out. Hey, hey. I, yeah. I have like a uh, hundred questions, but I'll start with one or two. How will a probe that goes that far down send telemetry to the surface? And then how will that telemetry be sent back to Earth? Uh, and I'll just start there because those seem like so good in other words, questions. Telemetry. Yeah. How, <laughs> how do we get the zeros and ones from whatever the probe finds? Yes. Kilometers deep into a very cold place, right? Mm -hmm. How does that telemetry get to the surface? Because uh, I could imagine the hole may not. You know, you're not building a, a, a channel, right? It, this is much smaller and probably suspect to like seismic activity maybe. Mm -hmm. And could it collapse on itself in route before it gets to the liquid water? Let's just stop there and let you take over. So there are a few elephants in the room and you pointed straight to one of them. <laughs> So there are a lot of people that are studying ways to have the data being transmitted effectively, because one interesting thing that we demonstrated with our experiments is that when the probe starts going down in the ice, the water from the ice or the, the ice turns into water and that water turns into water vapor because the pressure on Europa is very, very, very low. It's very similar to what like a vacuum chamber would be here on Earth. And so this water turns into vapor. And when the vapor touches the surface of the hole, the hole is very cold. So it touches the surface. Water vapor touches something that is cold, it condensates. And if that condensation gets below zero Celsius, it freezes. So we start having that water vapor coming into the contact with the, the the walls of that borehole and condensating and freezing back. And not long after the probe passes, it ends up with the hole getting completely closed behind the probe. So yes, we cannot have like an open hole because we need to have 25 kilometers of heated wow. probes to be able to keep that hole open. And that's not something we can do. It would take too much energy. So we have a probe that is going to have ice on top of it, ice on, on the bottom and ice on the sides and ice everywhere. And one thing that people are doing that we also developed in my PhD thesis was to have some type of... Um, spool that unspools from within the probe so that the probe can still keep going down after the hole behind it freezed <laughs> it's completely like frozen back mm -hmm. um, but even if there is this type of, of of wire we would need first we would need a lot of kilometers of cables inside the probe which would make everything super heavy and the probe bigger and if you have a bigger probe then it means you need to melt more ice to go through so you're consuming more power and so you're going slower well, your so trade -offs get ugly there don't yeah trade-offs get really ugly and besides that as you mentioned the ice the ice like crusts are not 100 percent stopped they are moving so yeah there might be a rupture in that cable and so there has been some very interesting studies on how to transmit information up and down. There has been some, some literature on using radio waves, but the radio waves will get not through the entire ice crust. So there are some studies on putting kind of like pucks every five kilometers or two kilometers or something like that. And Peter, having this like right? 
Like a repeater? Yes, something like a repeater in the middle. So you keep like transmitting information from here to here. And then this next puck gets the information and transmits up and then up and up. And there, there have been some studies on that. There have been some studies on using um, ultrasound. And it's, yeah, if someone solves that problem, it's a big elephant in the room that wow. is going to you, <laughs> leave the room. Such a, a nice picture. Uh, in my mind, I think about a, a, a roller a ice skating blade, you know, where the blade is, there's pressure and it gets liquefied. But as soon as the blade leaves that section of ice, then that ice quickly refreezes. I'm yes. thinking about you as an extraterrestrial 3D version in the vertical direction of an ice skating blade. Oh, yes. Nice. Cross slicing it down. Yeah. And it melts, right? The pressure of the blade melts mm -hmm. it. But as soon as you leave, it refreezes quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's from pressure. Have um, And then I think about how thin that wire must be to get 50 kilometers of wire. Uh, I, I mean, you're talking, you know, minute uh, it what a wonderful optimization problem this can i just say that. one thing mm -hmm. i had to like solder probably about 50 sensors to a wire that was 0.25 millimeters in dia diameter <laughs> that's human and, hair size right yeah that's about like a human hair so yeah that's how thin how does that wire. not even break how does that how does that even it was it was like getting like glasses and then putting like big glasses over your glasses and then those like lenses on top of the soldering iron and then like all the the sensors have like those tiny legs that are very close to each other so you cannot have any type of metal that connects them because if you do they're going to short and the short sensor is like right. burned wow. so like oh 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 wow yeah <laughs> Are you waiting for carbon nanotubes to come and save you for uh, in like the strength of a, do you get the tensile strength you need from like a nanotube or is it going to be some kind of exotic metal alloy? I don't know. I don't know enough about carbon nanotubes, but uh, maybe. <laughs> well, they talk about them for space elevators, right? For the tensile yes. strength and, and they're really long. You can make long ones. What if you manufactured the line that you needed in situ as you're going down what if you manufactured what you needed actually i'm not sure about that now i just think there's too many there's so many questions what uh and of course you know early on in this conversation i thought well how is it going to get back from the hole but when you said 20 to 50 kilometers this is a one-way trip yep <laughs> uh, one is it obviously uh, is there something other than nuclear power that would give you any chance of doing that job and not with the technology we have available today. So even with the currently available nuclear reactors, it would take us like decades to go through the ice. So there is a, yeah, there is a very pressing need for people to develop more um, power dense nuclear reactors. Uh, let's put it that way because nuclear reactors are amazing they have like a lot of power that is being released but they also are very large so there are some um new technology coming up and there are a lot of research happening and trying to miniaturize nuclear power sources but um for a probe to go through through the ocean through the ice and reach the ocean of europa we are really hoping that that development happens quickly wow, wow. <laughs> and we can soon have a very dense power source right well i want to circle back to well, wait, and connect you, I have a question about that would that contaminate anything if you had the nuclear if there was if you had to use something like that to get down would that contaminate anything on the bomb potentially that's a tough question so normally when we have nuclear reactors we have a lot of shields around it so a lot of Kind of containers inside a container inside a container inside a container <laughs> to make sure that nothing right, that nothing doesn't. leaves um right. but depending on how much we have to uh, decrease the size of the power source so that we have a small enough probe so that we can go down in an efficient way um, we might need to remove one or two of those containers so hopefully there is a, a power source that is efficient or inefficient right. depending on how you think about it well yeah um, enough. About remove the shielding <laughs> and let the radiation i don't know how you know i don't know that how much you know radioactive decay generates heat 
you know, like that conversion, but mm -hmm. maybe the radioactive decay itself is the heating element for the making the tunnel. I, I don't know. I, I want to circle back and connect what you have just described, which is an enormous optimization problem with mm -hmm. technologies that may or may not exist to your experience with the CubeSats, which is my happy place with my, you know, our students, because I'd like you to connect the dots between your, the optimization choices and things that you made in your uh, collegiate career prior to being a professor now with CubeSats and how you have to optimize there. Is there any, uh, any short stories you might tell us about optimization in your CubeSat life? I think one big, very important thing that is, um, I will call it optimization. It's more like a coordination um, probably, but that is super important for satellites is how all the subsystems are connected. And that's one thing that <laughs> I think most people, including myself, learn the hard way. So if you have, for example, a CubeSat and you have a, a camera and that camera needs five watts and you have solar panels and your solar panels only deliver three watts. So, okay, now you need bigger solar panels. And so you, okay, you do the calculations and if you have this deployable solar panel, now you have enough power. But then to be able to handle that power, you need a bigger battery. And to have the bigger battery, you need an extra um, electronic board to do all the controllings of the system. And then to do that, you need to add a structure to be able to hold all those boards together. And then also to do that, we need to have some heaters that are, that are going to make sure all the electronic components are in a good temperature. And with that, you need more power again. <laughs> and so you, it's, it's so interconnected and everything depends on everything. And one little change in one subsystem will end up affecting like all the other subsystems. So this, it's kind of a coordination mixed with an optimization problem. And you need to, to make sure that all the subsystems are aligned and all the decisions are made and, and, and transmitted <laughs> accordingly so that everyone goes ahead with the same on the same page. Thank you. Well, my final question is this. Um, what is the future for you at Florida Tech? Ha, that's a great question. So I really want to be the PI on a CubeSat. Uh, so far, I've been like the lead student on a couple of CubeSats, but it's now as a professor, I'm like, okay, now I'm I'm going to go and find some funding and then put the lab together and then have a lot of students and start guiding them and empowering the students so that they too can go in the clean room and assemble everything and do the design. And, and I really hope that in a few years, there will be a CubeSat from Florida Tech that is orbiting the earth. Kevin can help you with that. That's for sure. And uh, I just, really I just feel like if I raise the money, you could do everything else, right? The money's the hard part, right? Not not your technical expertise, just the money. So for me, honestly, right now, that has been the most difficult <laughs> thing because that's the thing I have the least experience with. Um, I helped write proposals when I was a student, but now it's like, okay, now I need to write the entire proposal myself from beginning to end and submit it. And okay, now- so overwhelming, right? That's where you were as a student. <laughs> we're doing all the, that work with a bunch of other students before for someone else, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and wow. And I've submitted a few proposals already, like in NASA websites and the Inspires. I don't know how familiar you are, but it's basically a platform where NASA puts the requests for proposals where yeah. you can submit proposals. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been selected twice there and nice. um, we apply every year. The kids come up with the mission statements and write the the payload parts, but wow. it's tough. I, I look so forward to following up with you. Um, we're going to have to wrap up our interview now just for our constraints and, and basically tutoring appointments and things, wow. but I, I'd like to follow up with you if that's okay about how that we could help you uh, be as successful as you can be because you're a fantastic role model for all of our CubeSat kids. And I want you to be very successful because you make it easier for us to do our part with the younger students. So yeah, we Thank really you appreciate so you taking this time today. Thank you so much. 